Warning, the Savage Nation contains adult language, adult content, psychological nudity. Listener discretion is advised. And now, America's most exciting radio talk show, The Savage Nation, home of unprotected talk, borders, language, culture, and here he is, Michael Savage. I would hope and I believe that every person in this room today understands that it is unacceptable to judge people, to discriminate against people based on the color of their skin. And I would also say that as a nation, the truth is that a nation which in many ways was created, and I'm sorry to have to say this from way back on racist principles, that's a fact. So this this, uh, virus, this Marxist virus, Bernie Sanders, uh, is gaining traction amongst the mindless drug addicted uh, millennials who grew up with iPhones in their hands and Ritalin in their blood. And he's an overt, uh, overt socialist. They don't even know what the word means. They don't know what happens under socialism. We're not talking about, we're not talking about Sweden. We're not talking about Denmark. Although if you look there, you can see a nightmare going on because of this pacifism related to socialism. The fact of the matter is that socialism is a disaster. If you look at Mao's China, if you look at the National Socialist Party of Germany under Hitler, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics under Stalin, Pol Pot's Cambodia, the prison camp of North Korea, you will see what socialism can metastasize into. And yet this dangerous demagogue Sanders is now putting out the poison, injecting it into the, into the bloodstream again. Something that we all learned in the fourth grade is that you don't discriminate against people based on the color of their skin like we never heard it before. But again, he's trying to show that he's really not against colored people that he's one with colored people, but he's not like all other white people, you see. He's different than other white people. He's better than other white people. He's above other white people. He's cleaner than other white people. This is the this is what the millennials are supporting. So I would ask you, how do you support a man like this, a Marxist virus? But this one, Sanders, is not only a carrier virus, but he's an infection himself. He is a retrovirus, and I'm gonna talk about that again On Friday, I did one of the greatest shows of my life called There's a Retrovirus in the White House, which, you know, if you missed the show, you missed one of the pinnacles, one of the peaks, one of the high points of my 21 years in radio, while others are talking about their past or mumbling about Bill Clinton doing Clinton imitations or attacking Hillary. I said, I'm not going to do this for a living. I didn't come this far. I didn't study so hard to do Bill Clinton in, 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 in imitations and talk about what I did in 1920. Either you reinvent every day, come up with something inventive and create or don't do talk radio, stay home. Stay home and count the money you made telling everybody how, how bad the world is. So I did a new show called There's a Retrovirus in the White House and I talked about the uh, national insanity and uh, I can't replay my show from Friday, although I would like to, but I'm going to give you a summary of it and I'll do so as the show emerges, because I said that the entire Democratic Party has been invaded and infected by Obama, who I compare with a retrovirus. And uh, the fact is that some Democrats had a scintilla of patriotism and a scintilla of uh, sanity before the retrovirus entered the White House, but that today the entire Democrat Party has been invaded by the retrovirus called Barack Obama. And it's infected them with his worldview that is so crazy, they don't even know what they're doing because they've been infected by his RNA. And that was an important you know, insight. But then I wake up and here's Bernie Sanders, bad enough last week, now he's going to the bottom of the barrel and talking about skin color. Uh, and yet he's gaining traction. I, again, don't want to talk too much about that today. I mean, politics, as usual, is interesting up to a point. I hope it's Trump versus Sanders pure capitalism versus pure socialism. And my prediction is 85-15, with Sanders going on to a resounding career in talk radio on a local station in Vermont where all the bonds are painted red. 85-15 would be actually generous of me if Bernie Sanders even got 15% of the stolen vote. I think that's about all the Democrats would be able to steal with this cretin. 
So that's one topic. What's amazing to me is that over the by the way, this is the this is the uh, first day of the Jewish New Year for my Jewish listeners who are fallen Jews. I think the Catholics call themselves lapsed Catholics. So we'll say lapsed Jews who are not in temple, who are listening to the Savage Nation instead. Considering this sort of brownie points, instead of, <laughs> instead of listening to some Woody Allen rabbi talking about the Syrian refugees and how you have to give to help save the world, tuning in to hear Reverend Rabbi Savage today. Uh, it's going to be an interesting show for me because I have many, st I would say stories, topics that are intriguing to me, and I think they'll be intriguing to you, but I, it's a slow start. It's a slow start for a couple of reasons, because it's a slow day in Cafe Savage. I went to a restaurant last night that's normally booming. It was empty, 50% of the crowd. That means that when the Jew, I have a Muslim friend, an acquaintance who owns a, um, a, uh, an Iranian restaurant. He made a joke a few years ago, which I've repeated a few times, but it's a funny joke. And the Muslim friend said to me, he said, when the Jews fast, Muslims starve. Well, I broke up into laughter because he understands being in the restaurant business that for some reason Jewish people seem to frequent restaurants. And uh, even though he uh, serves Iranian cuisine, which is certainly not Jewish cuisine, a good portion of his clientele in San Francisco happen to be Jewish. So when Jews fast, Muslims starve. You get the joke? Well, last night I went to this Italian restaurant and it was half empty. But I guess, you know, a glass half that empty is better than a glass 100% empty. I had my spaghetti and went home with Teddy, and that was that. Do you support Bernie Sanders' socialist uh, virus and why? What do you actually think this retrovirus can do to, to save the nation? Tell me. I mean, come on, be clear with me. Unless all of the liberals aren't even listening today. I don't know where they are. That's topic one. But here's the real kicker. This came out Friday night at midnight. It should have, it should have had, the, the marshal should have gone in and arrested Obama and Kerry with handcuffs. Ten minutes later, they should have gone in with handcuffs and arrested both of them for having lied to the world and the American morons. Right after the retrovirus in the White House lied, cheated, and stole to push the Iranian nuclear deal down our throats, just like he did at uh, socialized medicine, so-called Obamacare. Right after it happened, Iran announced that it found unexpectedly high uranium reserves. Right after the retrovirus pushed the deal forward. I said, this can't be possible. What's impossible to believe, though, is that the left-wing fanatics at the U.S. think tanks Carnegie Endowment and the Federation of American Scientists said that Iran had no uranium. They said the scarcity and low quality of Iran's uranium resources compelled it to rely on external sources of natural and processed uranium so there'd be no fear of them developing a nuclear weapon. That's so much for the Carnegie Endowment and the Federation of American Scientists. But it really tells you that Obama and Kerry committed what amounts to basically a war crime against, not only against the truth, it's astounding that nobody even knows this. Even intelligent people don't know this. Right after the liar, the virus, the retrovirus, pushed the deal forward, Iran said that they found unexpectedly high uranium reserves a day later. How is that possible? How could you believe this? How could people like Dianne Feinstein the next day go to a Jewish temple in San Francisco, Temple Emmanuel, and sit there like God Almighty when she knows in her heart that she sold Israel and the Jewish people down the river? How could she do it? How could she and her husband, Richard Blum, get up in the morning? To me, they're like the Madoffs. Now, you say, come on, you're making a leap there. I was reading a... Um, a biography of the Madoffs that I got in the mail called Truth and Consequences, Life Inside the Madoff Family. I became interested with this gangster recently because there's going to be a TV biopic on him played by Robert De Niro, and De Niro is one of my favorite actors. I frankly can't wait to see it done. But the story of Madoff is really the story of America in many ways. I know you say, what? We're not all crooks. No, but most of us have been surrounded by thieves and crooks our whole lives. And many of us ran away from the thieves and the crooks, like Madoff. We've known Madoffs in our life. Everyone's had a Madoff in their family, a Madoff moment, by the way, on a minor scale. You don't? It doesn't matter what your religion or race is. Everybody's had a little Madoff in their, in their family. He was just smarter than most of them. But when you look at the pictures of him and his family, the children, 
uh, back in 76, 77, Andrew at Roslyn Co-op Nursery School, Andrew, Ruth, and Mark at Mark's Bar Mitzvah in 1977. It's, they're cringing moments. They make you cringe. They make you cringe. And then it brings up something else, which is a little delicate for me to bring up, to, particularly on Rosh Hashanah. But I don't think there are any Jewish people listening, so I'll dare say it. There's a cringiness about Madoff and the self-righteousness of Ma the Madoffs of the world that gets a lot of people very upset. And then there is this element that's very, I have to walk a tightrope I've never walked before. This one has to go up 12,000, 15,000 feet in the air. And I'm gonna need an oxygen mask to do this right because it could be a career ender. So I'll have to think about it. I'll be right back as I put on my oxygen mask to talk about, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. Jews who are uncomfortable with Bernie Madoff and other prominent people of the Jewish faith who have destroyed America and the world. Let's put it to you that way. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. My Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust to protect my wealth. Call 800-B-U-I-C-O-I-N. If you follow the arc of the American Jewish experience, since this is Rosh Hashanah, that's what I'll talk about a little bit. How do we go from Jonas Salk or Albert Einstein to Bernie Madoff and Katzenberg, Katzenberg, Matzenberg, and Ratzenberg? How do we go from one to the other? At 7 a.m. on December 11, 2008, the FBI knocked on Bernie Madoff's penthouse door. His doorman had called up to announce their arrival, and Ruth and Bernie changed out of their pajamas and into t-shirts and jeans. Bernie left the apartment quietly. The sensitive agent waited to cuff him until he was out of view of his, la of his wife. And then, of course, they, they put him in prison. Then they go before the judge, and he put up their, the houses that they stole from people as, uh, as bail. Ten million dollars was nothing. Remember, this guy, this guy stole 50 billion, not million, 50 billion dollars. They were living on it their whole lives. And so they're required to live at home. You know, they're allowed to have home, home, whatever, detention. And listen to this. The night and the next day, the apartment was outfitted with highly sophisticated surveillance equipment. Now, Ruth and Bernie Madoff hired a security firm, one of the conditions of his bail. Ruth was astonished by the staggering cost of the service, $30,000 a month. Ruth says, it was a fortune and came from money he'd been accused of stealing. He paid his lawyers and security firm out of that money and was free on bail. A poorer person would not get the same treatment. It was incredible to me, said Ruth Madoff. So she didn't go to jail, by the way. She didn't go to jail. She lived off the, the proceeds of this ganif, this crook. But she didn't go to jail. I want to know where the money is hidden. To this day, where is it hidden? There must be hidden money. But anyway, you look at the book... The Truth and Consequences Inside the Madoff Family by Laurie Sandell. And you see the pictures of them, 1974, in the cockpit of his, of his yacht. Uh, Bernie would later replace the bull with a 56-foot Ribovich sport fishing boat that he would own until his arrest. And I look back at my own 1970s. I was struggling. They wouldn't hire me because I was white. I had two children. Actually, I only had one at the time. And there's another picture of them. Living the high life, boys dressed in suits and ties, Andrew and Mark at the Bar Mitzvah. Andrew lands one of his first fish in Montauk, 1974, fishing on the bull in Montauk, 1972. The Madoffs celebrate Andrew's 12th birthday at Chubb K, 1978. There's the tan Bernie and the tan Ruth with the tan boys in the Bermuda shorts leading the high life. And, and so on, there's, there's the boy catching a 315-pound bluefin tuna off Montauk with the happy thief father, the curly-haired father, the smiling devil behind him, proud of his young offspring. On and on, you look at the Madoffs on a family ski vacation, Aspen on Valentine's Day 1984, I think of my 1984, playing it straight, what it got me. And I look at these pictures, and I say, where is the justice in the world? Where is the just God in the world? Where is the just God in the world?